Perfect. Everything gets silent perfectly at one o'clock. That's, that's nice. I even have, don't have to say something. Yeah. Hi and welcome um, to my talk. Um, my name is Sebastian Eholtz. I work at the Intel Corporation. And um, over the last uh, year, I worked on inter integrating path guiding into cycles. And this is um, like our talk about it, how path guiding works, what it is. We try to give you a high level overview of, of what is path guiding, how we integrate it, and how you can use it uh, to make actually nicer scenes, and which have way more realism, and you can do stuff you probably couldn't done before. So that's pretty much it, and thanks for your attention, and I will now start. So what is path guiding is, path guiding is a method which can change images like this if you try to render something physically correct in the same time to give you something like this. And here we have a direct comparison. And in this talk, I'm going to take you by hand step by step to explain you how is this actually possible. So, so we start, what is path guiding? I could just start with all the math and start with the rendering equation, Monte Carlo integration, variance, optimal important sampling, the theoretical part of zero variance, and in two hours we would still be here. I would look at all your faces and it would, they would look identically like my students. We're just like, oh my gosh. So let's keep it simple and let's, let's go on it on a higher level and actually like what does it mean if we just look at it from an artist's perspective, what is going on here. So if you render an image, usually using a path tracer like Cycles, you, you're used to that you have noisy images. Like over time, they're getting better. So the, the big question is, why do we have noise to begin with? So the basic idea is um, that a path tracer, when it wants to figure out how, what is the color of a pixel, it shoots random paths in a scene. And each of these paths is actually an estimator for the color of the pixel, which is not uh, very accurate. But if you take an average about a lot of different samples, then actually everything converts to the actual uh, pixel. So, and the noise level is actually the variance. That means it is um, the spread of all these estimates. Um, and when you have a high variance, then the spread is is high between each individual estimates. And if you have a low variance, then they are actually closer, meaning you have a lower noise level. And this noise, noise level uh, depends on the way how your path tracer can actually generate these random walks, um, which estimate the final pixel color, proportional to the contribution of all the light and the light distribution in the scene to this one pixel. So why do we have noise in our standard path tracer, it's pretty easy. Like, if you would like to distribute everything proportional to its contribution, you would need to know everything about the light distribution to begin with for, to solve the problem you want to solve. So meaning we have a chicken and egg problem. So what the path tracer is then doing, it takes the information it has, meaning I have a point in the scene, and the only information I have is about the material at this specific point, which means here for a diffuse surface, I know how the diffuse surface would reflect like light. So what, what we are doing, we take this information, we are at a diffuse point, meaning we shoot a random ray um, proportional equal, almost equally in all directions. And so we hit another surface. This surface, for example, is a glossy surface. A glossy surface reflects in a, in a cone of directions, meaning now we, shoot, we select a new direction based on this cone, like the reflection property of our local material here, and we hit another surface. Here, for example, we have a mirror, a perfectly specular mirror, which means incoming direction uh, reflected on the normal, incoming direction equals, uh, goes to the outgoing direction. We make a direct connection, which again brings us now to the couch. So this concept uh, of generating random walks works quite well if the indirect illumination, which actually interacts with each point, are more or less smooth or uniform. Then you actually get a really, really low noise level. But in reality, you don't have it. So now you might ask, hey, if I look at the scene, I have a window, I have small light sources. Why is it working in here when this looks more not really like diffused? 
their artists come into play. Like over the years when people uh, learned working with path tracers um, to make their images, they learned a lot of tricks to actually make this work, like adding virtual, virtual light sources to mimic indirect illumination, uh, adding some hero lights there to change the look of some specific area. So artists really learned a lot of tool sets to make this one algorithm which usually only works quite nicely if you have a uniform incoming light distribution with faking stuff and adding stuff to make it work so that they get image in their specific time budget. So let's take this scene and take out all these hacks. Like, like really try to just use three light sources in the room and a sunlight coming uh, from outside through the window. And suddenly we see we have a super high noise level. So, and, and why is it that, like for example, if we are on the ceiling, we have the assumption that hey, our material is diffuse, equally reflects in all directions, so, um, but we have here this bright spot on the floor illuminating the whole room, meaning the probability of generating a path from this ceiling which actually hits this bright spot is super low, which means we have a high variance. Each estimate will go a far steps or yeah, oscillate uh, pretty high around the actual value. So this is where path guiding comes into place. So the idea is to not only use the material property, but also use some sort of approximation of the incoming light distribution at each individual point in a scene to combine these two to make better sampling decisions. So instead of just going diffuse based on the material, we also look, hey, what is the a possible light distribution we have here, which is important for the actual pixel value. So we see here, for example, if we are looking from the ceiling, we have to go down to this bright spot. Or if we are at the wall, we also have to go also down to the bright spot. And if you can compare here, like if you just look at the material, the um, sampling distributions would be similar, but just oriented based on the surface orientation. But if you look at the incoming light distribution, they differ at each individual position uh, in the scene. So here's a side-by-side -side comparison of applying path guiding in this scene with the same number of samples. And you can see that if you add path guiding to, to this and add this additional information about the indirect illumination, this actually can reduce your, uh, the variance of your rendering quite, no, uh, quite big. So easy. Let's just implement path guiding, that sounds awesome. So let's start. Um, yeah, first, path guiding is something where researcher actually started already in the 90s playing around with it. This was a time where people were happy being able to render 60 times 60 images um, and had 32 megabytes of RAM, which was quite interesting. They, they already did something, but they were super happy being able to render the Cornell books. So also with, if you want to do now path guiding it, it would have caused a lot of memory consumption. So the research community went more into directions where they said, okay, let's, let's try to continue more finding better ways like metropolitan light transport, bi-directional path tracing, photon mapping, all the stuff you probably have heard of. So in the probably 2015, like this, there was more or less a revival of the idea. We have no more compute, we have no more memory that people actually picked it up again and start working on it. And since then, we have a bad load of papers, um, which all have their own path guiding method. So, and all have their pros and cons, all have their nitty details. Some work some, uh, in some specific area, some work in other specific area. So if you just say, hey, let's just implement path guiding, the big question is path guiding, sure, which version? And also the big question is for, for you as artists, yeah, which version will work for me? Like, because all, all stuff usually, uh, when they come from the scientific realm, we, we, we usually test them on smaller scenes. We, we have our standard tests where, yes, there it works, but if you are in a production render, you do, you do not want to have an algorithm which sometimes works, sometimes not. Do I turn it on? Do I turn it off? It should be quite easy, not many parameters, so easy to pick it up. And this is actually where we as Intel came up with the idea, okay, let's take all these papers, boil them together into one open source library, 
so that we can actually generate something which people who build renderers can use to have an easy access to integrate path guiding into their renderers. So this library is called Intel's Open Path Guiding Library, or short, Intel Open PGL. And it's actually our newest component in our one API rendered kit component, where for some stuff you probably already know, like Embry or Open Image Denoise, or even OpenVKL. So the basic idea about, about it is that we have a production ready implementation which makes it easy for people to integrate it. The nice thing is it's open source, 100%, so it's easy for uh, Blender to pick it up, to use it, and so on. So the basic idea, uh, foundation of it are actually three um, popular path guiding papers, which we took and then combined them together in this library. So, and one of the two features of our libraries are that and it is, is an incremental learning approach, which means during rendering, you can learn directly your distribution of the incoming light distributions, meaning you do not have any pre-processing step which, which uh, needs you to wait. You, you just click render and you directly have something to see and it gets better and better over time. And the, se the second features are our guided sampling decisions, which then use this approximation we learn to guide uh, a renderer-like cycles in the right direction so that you find uh, indirect illumination and light sources way better. So how does this incremental learning approach work? So we take cycles, you, do, you render it like your first sample per pixel, um, and then doing that rendering process, we generate a set of training samples um, for each um, position of, of your paths you, you were generating in your first path we are passing this to OpenPGL to fit this representation, which can then offer uh, cycles for its second rendering iteration, like already some data, to make better sampling decisions for the second sample per pixel. And this continues and goes on and goes on and can actually be continued forever so that over time your, your representation gets better and your sampling gets better. So let's make an ex show an example. So this is a, a kitchen scene with some complex indirect illumination. And this is like um, the sampling quality of rendering four samples per pixel by just like the information we have about the scene if we didn't, do not start training. So this would be the outcome. If we would now render just one sample per pixel, train our distribution, and then delete the image, just render four samples, we actually get already this um, sampling quality. And even like if, if we would do the same thing after 16, 16 samples per pixel, this would be the sampling quality if we would um, now render four samples per pixel, which already looks quite nice. Like you see over the time, the sampling gets better and better. So how do we make the sampling better and better by having this approximation of the incoming light at each point? So for direct, for surfaces, for example, what we can do is we can just directly query at each point an approximation of the incoming light. It means it tells you where are important indirect light directions, where are important direct light directions. And you can then use this to generate a sampling distribution. If you're on a diffuse surface, you can even multiply it with the cosine lobe, which gives you an almost perfect sampling decision for, diffu uh, for materials with have diffuse components, like for evaluating this diffuse component. Um, so, and this is really useful, especially in, on indirect illuminated surfaces, and as I mentioned, especially for diffuse uh, materials with diffuse components. So here's a side-by-side -side comparison if you just let it render for uh, 64 samples per pixel. This is also a little bit a hard scene because um, there is a caustic through this glass table on the floor, so that means all the paths would need to find this caustic, which has a really, really strong indirect illumination on that. So, but we also can look at volumes. So in volumes, we also have an approximation of the incoming radiance at each point in the volume. But, but here we also support to directly take the scattering behavior of the phase function into account when making the, the new guided sampling decisions. And this helps a lot for um, for indirect illuminated volumes, for example, if you have something outside a, a, a ray, like a, um, a god ray or so, like there usually um, you do not know that 
you should go in the direction of the God ray because that, that's where the indirect light comes from, from the next bounds. This is where um, guided um, vol volume sampling decisions can help you. And also, like, if you want to simulate um, subsurface scattering physically correct by really building some, some um, object which has a, a bounding surface and put a volume in it, this is where it can help. Like, here we have an example where we actually just model physically correct um, the skin uh, of an ob object, and then we have some really, really dense volumetric material with a high albedo, and which has a isotropic phase function, which would mean usually you just go in a direction where you say, oh, randomly on a sphere, I'm going in any direction. But if you look at subsurface scattering, you actually want to go, either, uh, when you have a, a dense media, usually back towards the, um, the skin, or if you are at a thin portion, like the ear, you probably also want to go through, through the, through the uh, object, because some light comes from behind. So this was more like the overview of what it is, how, how does it work a, a, a little bit. Now the big question is how, do, how can I use it now with Blender 3.4? And that's actually quite easy. Like you will have, when you have the CPU device, um, which is currently the version we implemented, we plan to also implement a GPU version of it. Um, you will have this small um, checkbox here where you can just enable path guiding. So we try to make it really simple. So you have one toggle, but to just enable, disable it. You can play around with separately enabling path guiding for surfaces or in volumes. And we have this um, parameter called training samples, which actually tells you how many training iterations you want to do. Because usually, like um, these uh, guiding distributions, they pretty much converge after 128 or 256 uh, iterations, meaning as soon as you surpass this, uh, this approach, it does not really bring you better sampling quality, but you still would have to store all the training data and you have to update your, your uh, distribution, which will give you some overhead. So by limiting this amount to, to this, these numbers, you actually have a little bit lower rendering uh, performance at the beginning, and afterwards you just stop training and just do complete rendering, which then is much faster. Oh yeah, which would have been on this slide. <laughs> so, not not a lot of options, easy to use. That at least what we hope. To, we hope. So let's see how it does it look in the wild. All the images I've shown you before are also images you usually see in all these path guiding papers. So the big question is, how does it really use by scenes made by artists? So here we have an um, example from a scene from uh, Jesus Sandoval, who, is an, who did, does a lot of uh, interior designs, um, which you can see. And this is like a five minutes renderer without path, uh, path guiding. And this is like the result after five minutes with path guiding enabled. And you can see here that um, especially in the indirect illumination part, it, it, it's much clearer at the same time. And, and the nice thing, it does not introduce you any bias, so it means it will converge to the same result, but much faster with way less samples. You can even go a little bit more crazy now with actually playing around with more indirect illumination, like having light sources reflected by a, a mirror. So this is an example from Kana Aslan um, from blenderartists.org, uh, um, who just played around a, a lot with this and built a scene where he just put in a lot of mirrors and, and some light sources. And this is what you usually get after 1,500 samples. This is what, what you get when you enable path guiding. Suddenly you see that, oh, there are light sources reflected by some specular materials. And, and they, they actually do a lot of indirect illumination. And this actually works quite out well. And because these were artists, they also use a lot of radiance clamping because usually you would, you would have a lot of fireflies in these scenes. So, you, so what you're doing is you throw in radiance clamping, which unfortunately makes your image darker. Yes, it clamps fireflies, but it also clamps all the energy you actually have in your scene. So, and with path guiding, you might still get some fireflies, but you can put the, um, the threshold for your radiant clampings way higher because these fireflies, which will be then uh, still there, this is like really, re they will be really, really high. 
And coming back to the scene I presented at the beginning, just to tell you what actually we, we render here in the scene is that we try to simulate here physically correct underwater uh, scenario, which means I have the water surface, which is a perfectly the dielect uh, dielectric material like glass, and inside we do not just do some absorption, we really do um, physically correct scattering um, of measured water, like of, of a clear Bahama seas, which means we have a thin volume, a super strong forward, uh, phase, uh, forward scattering phase function with a high, high albedo. And suddenly you see, in, in this scenario, everything is actually a, a, a simple caustic. So, and actually, if you enable path guiding, you actually can get, you can get the caustic on the floor, and also you, you can get all the multiple scattering inside the volume, which is really a, a nice thing. <coughs> what I have to tell here, yes, you can see caustics, but these are simple caustics. So, they are not super crazy done by multiple interactions of caustics, or they are caustics generated by caustics. Um, I will tell a little bit more about that later. Um, but they are simple, more like, okay, we, we have like one dielectric surface which actually generates these effects. And, and this, this is where path guiding works quite well. So at the end, some, also some advices for you as artists, like what can I do with path guiding or what should I think about when I want to use path guiding. One thing which came up with a lot of people I, I, I talked to which actually also have path guiding implemented in their production renderer is Yes, it, it, it's a nice feature, but sometimes it's hard because artists learned so good how to build scenes that they are renderable with our current limitations. So they will build the same scene and then the effect of path guiding is just, yeah, it's nice. But so because they already changed their scenes in a way that, oh yeah, let's make shorter, pa shorter bounces, replace the actual indirect illumination with a virtual light source. Um, and now they actually have to start teaching them, though, hey, be more experimental. Try to use less fakes and only use them now if you really want to go on nuances of your scene. You want it a little bit brighter here. You want to uh, change your hero spot. On you could try now to only use virtual, point lights, uh, virtual light sources there instead of trying to mimic the whole indirect illumination of the scene. You, you can now try to use their more physical light setups and let path guiding help you to reduce the noise there and only focus on, on the artistic freedoms, uh, what you want. Also coming back to caustics, yes, you will see it helps you with caustics, but as I mentioned with simpler caustics, it's not a caustic solver, so it's not the holy grail which helps you suddenly to build the craziest <coughs> scenes. As long as the renderer itself, for example, if you render like 2,000 samples, um, sees a little bit of the caustics without path guiding, you have a chance because path guiding works in, in the way we implemented it by learning from previous rendering iterations. So if you, if you build a scene where after 2,000 samples, like the probability of even generating one path which is connected to a caustic uh, is super, super low, then, then we can't learn it because we would need 1,000 or 2,000 samples to even get a, get a hint of it that there is maybe something. So as long as you build scenes which have a pretty modest probability of finding something, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it, it has to have a modest probability of finding something, then path guiding can actually learn this stuff and help you with that. Then also indirect radiance clamping. Usually, um, it is often used pretty aggressive because you want to reduce the noise into fireflies. This is something you can now try to higher the, um, the threshold. Or if you want to compare two images, if, if they look the same, you actually have to turn it off to, if you want to know if both converge to the same result. Without path guiding, it probably takes way, way longer. But with path guiding, it's um, much, more, um, much quicker. And another thing is shadow visibility. This is also a hack widely used, but the problem is how it is implemented in most cases, as well as in cycles, is, is that the look will change if you use shadow visibility. And this, this is um, a problem because shadow visibility is a biased approach. It will 
generate an incorrect image to begin with. And if we change the sampling probability using path guiding, then some of the weighting inside the renderer will change the contribution you suddenly have from these light sources with shadow visibility. So if, if you want to be um, consistent, try to avoid using that. If not, yeah, then you can still use it. So a small outlook. So I presented what, what is more or less the current state. So current, like in the future, we also want to improve our library, OpenPGL, by adding more features, like also guiding the termination decisions of a path. Because um, at the moment, how a usual renderer is doing it, it just thinks about, oh, I'm looking at my current position. If it's, if it's a dark surface, I have a high probability of terminating the path. If I have a bright surface, I have a low probability of terminating the path. But this does not mean what is the expected contribution of the path. So I, I don't know, OK, yes, I bounce multiple times on a dark surface. Am I still hitting a bright light source at some point? And with guided Russian roulette, we can take this into account. Also, um, on the cycle side, um, our next features we want to implement is guiding on translucent surfaces as well as on glossy surface component. Currently, we path guiding only activates if your material has a diffuse component. And also, uh, there is some work with the people who implemented MNNE to actually combine this together so that probably we can combine both like the, uh, the limitations of MNNE and the way that path guiding can direct you in some sort of caustic combine it to actually probably generate a better caustic solver, which would help you a lot. So this brings me almost to the end of my talk. And I want to say thank you especially to the Blender team, which helped a lot with with the integration and actually gave us the opportunity to integrate this. And um, especially to Ton, Brecht, Sergey, and Ray. And also to the Blender artist community, which probably two hours after I put the branch online, people directly took it and tried to build it. And they were going crazy with it. I can't name all the people who, who get it. But what I can tell you, please go go on blenderartist.com, look for this thread, and also just look at the images they are posting. They are going nuts. <laughs> this is really like, this was a this is really nice interaction with them. They all try out the most craziest stuff I've never have thought of actually trying, which also pretty much helped us to make OpenPGL way more robust and also the integration into cycles. So, and at the end, I also want to do what what do you want to do next? Maybe I want to say, um, advertise like another talk from a colleague of mine, Xavier, who will have a, a talk tomorrow about the one API backend and cycles and how this actually makes it possible to use cycles on Intel, on, on our new Intel uh, GPUs. And as well, I, you can visit um, a new web page from, from us, uh, createintel.com, Blender where we will collect all uh, interesting information about these technology sessions, some demo videos, some tech blogs. And also you have a chance to win a, a new a small hardware upgrade, so with uh, some Arc GPUs as well as uh, a NUC. So thank you for your attention, and I hope this was informative for you.